All right, good to see you here this evening. Welcome to the midweek service. Looking forward to a great time together this evening. Take your Bible this evening and go to 2 Timothy, would you please? 2 Timothy chapter 1. Xavier, if we could have these on medium, that'd be great. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to begin on verse 11, and I'll read through the end of the chapter. Verse 11 says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus thou knowest very well. Father, add your blessing now to the reading of our scripture tonight, and as once again look at this first chapter of 2 Timothy, help us to glean tonight the truths that you would have us to glean. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts as we go through these verses and what Paul wanted to stress to Timothy and what prayerfully you will stress to each one of our hearts. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We talked tonight about making a difference, and here in 2 Timothy, Paul's last epistle before he dies, he's beheaded, and he's, we talked last week about seven tremendous themes that he wanted to make sure Timothy would stay with, and tonight we'll talk about how would you want to be remembered. Someone said, if you want to know how much you'll be missed when you're gone, Stick your finger in a bucket of water and then remove it. The hole that's left will be how much you're missed. Now when you ask yourself, how will I be remembered? Now I know you don't think much about that when you're younger. But as you grow older, 
you begin to think about that. And I'm sure as Paul was getting where he was in his life, he's thinking about his remembrance and what would he leave behind as a legacy for his life. In other words, if you died tonight and your funeral was later this week, what would people say about you? What would they say about your life? Let me sharpen that up just a little bit. What will the people who know you best say about your life? Not just anybody, but the people you've lived with. Maybe your spouse or your children, your close friends. They know the truth because they've seen you in many different circumstances, many different situations of life and how you've handled them. As they walk back to their cars after the service is done and the caskets closed, how will you be remembered? What will they say? For Paul, that's no idle question. That was something very important to him. He knew his days were numbered and he knew those numbers were quickly running out. He knew that the... He didn't have five years left. He probably didn't have five months left when he wrote this epistle. The, sands, the grains of the sand had nearly all but slipped from the hourglass. Death by beheading wasn't very far away. Paul knew he wasn't getting out of that prison cell alive. He knew that. That's why he said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. He knew his race was done. He knew his race was over. So there's only one thing left to do, and that is I've got to send another message to my protege, my son in the faith, Timothy, and, and make sure that I give him some instructions and I give him some encouragement. And so Paul gives us some things here about how, to be, how we can be remembered well. And that involves three aspects. If you're going to be remembered well, three things, three aspects are involved. Number one is what we were. Notice verse 11, Paul said, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. By the way, he said almost the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 7 says this, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I believe the order is important. I believe God is a God of order. When, when God puts certain things in the Bible in a certain order, it's for a reason. And it's for a purpose. And so the order of things are important. And he says, first of all, he says, I'm appointed a preacher. Preacher. Over and over, I want you to hold your finger there in Timothy and turn with me over to the book of Acts. Would you please? Acts chapter 10 is where we'll begin. Acts chapter 10. Notice with me, if you will, in verse number 42. Peter is talking here, but he's relating what Jesus had taught them to do. And he says in verse number 42, And He, that's Christ, He commanded us to do what, church? Preach unto the people and to testify that it is He which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Now look at Acts 14. Acts 14 and verse number 15 with me, please. Here they've... Uh, Paul and Barnabas have uh, uh, come into Lyconia and they, they want to make gods of them. And so when the apostles understood that, in verse 14, they rent their clothes, they tore their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out, here's verse 15, and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. 
preaching to you. Notice chapter 15 and verse number 21. Chapter 15 and verse 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues, synagogue, uh, synagogues every Sabbath day. They preached Moses in chapter 16. And you get to 16 verse number 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Preach, 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 preach. Everywhere you go. In chapter 17, in verse 3, when he gets to Thessalonica, he's opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. I'm saying this country needs preaching. We need to get back to having preachers again in our country. There's nothing wrong with America that some good old-fashioned preaching couldn't cure. We have to get preaching back in the pulpit again. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.21, it pleases God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And it's that, that's God's program. It's always been God's program. And it's still God's program today. You say, well, we have, we have this music and we have this program and we have this choir and we have this, uh, this going on. Listen, not, not opposed to other things, but listen, don't rule out preaching. It's still the pleases God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You say, well, you just can't preach to people these days. Well, you take that up with God. God says it pleases Him through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The Bible's plain that preaching is the way God works. Preaching is the way that Christ is lifted up. Preaching brings men to a decision about what they'll do with Jesus Christ. We need preaching. Preaching. Nothing surpasses the importance in God's plan of saving men as preaching does. Nothing should take the place of preaching. It's, it's sad in many churches today. Uh, you go to the service and there's, there's an hour of music and about a 12-minute sermon. That's about average in a modern church. And there's, there's all kinds of music and all kinds of other things and very little preaching. And, and we have to get back to preaching. When, when men give little sermonettes instead of bold and powerful commanding discourses, Christianity dwindles. Christianity wanes. When Paul wrote to Timothy, later on we'll come to it in chapter 4, he said this, he said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Timothy, there'll come a time when people won't endure sound doctrine. They're not going to endure the sound preaching of God's Word. What will they do? Heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. Not preachers. Teachers having itching ears. Oh, I would contend to you, there's many different teachers that you can listen to. But most of the time, false doctrine and false, false teaching doesn't come from preaching, it comes through teaching. And there's false teachers. That's why Paul, he told Paul, do the work of an evangelist. We're to preach the Word of God. The, the pastor's to preach God's Word. The missionary is to preach God's Word. That means we don't just preach the gospel, though we preach the gospel. But we must preach the whole counsel of God. We must preach the entire Bible. There's other things in the Bible besides salvation. There's, there, there's many other things in the Bible as the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount and, 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 and other things that teach us about how to live for God. Or the epistles that Paul wrote. Teach us, and so we have to declare, as Paul said to the church at Ephesus, the whole counsel of God. Preaching must be Bible preaching. Reprove, rebuke, 
and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's preaching. Preaching reproves you. And listen, it's a day when we live in the snowflake age. I know. Everybody wants to get offended. And everybody says, oh, he... listen, when, when God says something wrong is wrong, it's wrong. And there, I, I still think there's people alive, there's people in, in our country that want to come to a church where somebody stands up with the authority of God's Word and says, thus saith the Lord. And this is what God wants you to do. And this is how God wants you to live. Everything should be based on the Bible and backed up by Scripture and backed up by, by uh, Scripture references. Give the preaching always makes clear the Scriptures. Makes clear the Bible. Certainly there's room for illustrations and there's uh, room, but those are secondary to the Scripture. Secondary to the Bible. And so... The Word of God must preeminent in preaching. The very first thing Paul always mentions is I'm ordained or I'm appointed a preacher. A preacher of the Gospel. You know, the second thing he mentions over in 2 Timothy is he said I'm appointed a preacher and an apostle. Now you remember there were two qualifications for an apostle. Number one is they were sent out by who? Jesus Christ. They were sent out by Jesus Christ. That's what you had to be to be an apostle. And number two, you had to have seen the resurrected Christ. That's why, I don't know if you caught it or not, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, if you look at it, when Paul said, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. Well, after that, some people might have raised their eyebrow and said, you're a what? Huh? You're an apostle. You were sent out by Jesus and you saw the resurrected Christ. Notice what, what follows that statement of apostle is a parenthesis. Personal note from the author to the reader. And Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. You had to put that in there to make sure they knew. I'm not making up stories here. Okay? He was sent out by Christ. How do you know that? Look at Acts chapter 9. Would you please? Acts chapter 9. This is the place where Saul was converted on the road to Damascus. The Lord is talking to Ananias about going to the house of Judas on the street called Straight and asking for Saul of Tarsus. And verse number 15, it says, But the Lord said unto him, he's talking to Ananias now, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Who's sending, who's sending Paul out? God sent him out. Jesus sending him out. He is sent forth by the Lord. Who did he see on the road to Damascus? He saw Jesus Christ. He saw something that's bright above the brightness of the sun. There's only one that's above the brightness of the sun, and that's the Son of God. And so Jesus appears to him. And, and he sees him there on the road to Damascus. That's why Paul said uh, that I, he was an apostle has one born out of due time. He said, I, I had a special uh, calling from God and I got to be an apostle. That's in 1 Corinthians 15.8. Now, let me make sure we understand something. There are no apostles today. Okay? No one has been personally sent out by Jesus Christ. We have because of His Word. But nor is they, have they seen the resurrected Christ. Okay? So there's no apostles today. Oh, I heard somebody on TV and he was apostle so-and-so. Well, that's what he calls himself, but that's not a Bible apostle. Okay? There's no, there's no apostles today, period. Alright? So we have he's a preacher. He's an apostle. And then he says, I'm a teacher of the Gentiles. I'm a teacher of the Gentiles. Now, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 again, would you please? 1 Timothy 3, Paul writes to Timothy and says, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to what? Teach. Apt to teach. We already said the first responsibility of the pastor is to preach. Preach the Word, okay? But it doesn't mean you don't ever teach. It means you're apt to teach. It means you're able to teach. 
Remember what we said earlier, 2 Timothy says, there'll come a time when people won't endure sound doctrine, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What's that mean? Teachers who will tell you what you want to hear. You ever have an itch you can't get to? Huh? Down your back or somewhere back here, and finally you, you, you get somebody close to you and say, hey, itch me right here, my, get my wife, you know. Here, no, up a little bit, over a little bit. Ah, oh, that's it right there. Doesn't that feel good when they hit the spot? I mean, that's it. That just feels good. That's what he says people do with preaching. I don't want to hear that guy. He's negative. I don't want to hear that guy. He's a downer. I don't want to hear that guy. He's too hard. Huh? Tell me, tell me, tell me everything's going to be okay. They all put their fingers like that. That's important, I guess. So, you know, everything's going to be all right. And you smile real pretty at the camera. You know? And, and everybody comes and they just t- tell me everything's going Tell me I'm okay, you're okay, my ship's coming in, my day's coming, my breakthrough's going to be here, God's on your side, and He's all for you, and you're going to have a great week this week, and let's go out there and get Him, and don't be discouraged by anything that happens. God's on your side, and it's going to be victory, and let's go get Him. And everybody claps and cheers, and out they go. And what'd they get? Nothing. They just got, they, they just got scratched where it itched. That's all that happened. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Huh? Isn't this wonderful? Let's, let's, let's keep it apt to teach. Able to teach. But let's major on the preaching of the Word of God. So the first thing, he's reminding Timothy, how are you going to be remembered? What you were. Paul said, I'll, I want to be remembered as a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. Of God's word. That's how I want to be remembered. I think that's how we remember him. But secondly, notice this back in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Here's the second aspect of how to be remembered. He said in verse number 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Hold fast the form of sound words. Those words hold fast means to be unmovable are to be firmly fixed. To be fastened or to be fixed on the the sound words that you've heard from Paul. Now he says something like this later on too in chapter 3. Would you look there with me please? Chapter 3 and verse 14. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 14. Do you see that? He says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He's urging him to hold fast, be firmly fixed on the words that you've heard from me and that you've heard from your mother and your grandmother. They taught you the word of God. They taught you the things of God. Saying, Timothy, hold fast to those words. And you do that by faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. First is faith. So how do you hold fast those words? You do it by faith. What is that? Believing they are the words of God. You hold fast those words if you really believe they're God's words. If they're not, don't worry about words. Don't worry about holding on to them. You don't need them. But we believe that they're God's words. We believe that all Scripture has been given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We believe every word. This doesn't just contain God's word. This is God's word. Every word belongs to God and is God's word. Now, I don't just believe God has inspired the word. I believe God has preserved His word. Okay? Inspired means God, God, the men didn't write what they wanted to write. They wrote what God told them to write. But then God preserved those words so we have copies of them. Let's look at Psalm 12 with me, would you please? Psalm 12. Biggest book there in the Old Testament, right about the middle of your Bible usually. Psalm 12. Notice what it says in verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, has silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. 
Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. How long? Forever. God has promised that He wouldn't just give us His words, but that He would preserve His word. How long? Forever. Jesus in the New Testament in Matthew 4 and verse 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Now, God says He'll preserve His Word forever. Jesus said we're to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, if that's the case, where is that? Where did God? Do we have every word of God? You know, I, I talked to a fellow, but he was a teacher of Greek at a Bible college, and you know what he told me? He said, you can be certain in the myriad of Greek manuscripts we have every word of God. Well, isn't that a blessing to you? Now, it might be a blessing to Brother Mike if he can read Greek. But most of us, we're out of luck. If that's, if that's where the every word of God is, you know what we have to do? We have to rely on Mike to tell us what God's words are. And for years, that's what the Catholic Church did. They didn't want people to read the Bible. They said, we'll tell you what the Bible says. You don't read it yourself. Some of you Hispanics, by there, you grew up Catholic. Am I right? Hmm? Philemon? True? Didn't encourage you to read the Bible, did they? No. God preserved His Word. Now, if, we, if God, Jesus says we have to live by every word, then where is it? See? I believe, we believe he's preserved his word, he's kept his word, and he's preserved it for the English-speaking people in your King James Bible. That's why we use the King James Bible. We believe, I, I, I just, listen, I'll, I respect you if you use some other version of the Bible and you believe that is God's preserved word. I'd have respect for that. But here's the problem. Things that are different are not the same. Isn't that profound? But when you have, I think the last count, there was over 200 different English versions of the Bible. Well, well they're, they're all different. And, and part of that is, by the way, part of that is money. They all have a copyright on, on their Bible so they can make money on it. You can take King James Bible. Now, as long as you don't have a note Bible, if you have a Bible with notes in it, they've, those, those notes are copyrighted. But I just have a regular Bible here, no notes in it, except markings of mine in the margin but I could I could lay that down on a copier put it all together and and sell it give it away do whatever I wanted I'm not breaking any laws King James Bible is the only Bible that lets you do that no other version of the Bible will let you do that they all copyrighted it so you can't reproduce it without paying them money God's preserved his word and and I don't understand why, it, why inspiration is important if you don't believe in preservation. Then, then what's the purpose? Why believe God breathed every word if He couldn't keep every word? It doesn't make any sense to me. So that's, and say, you, you believe it? Yeah, I believe it by faith. By faith, I believe that. Okay? That's simple, by faith. Then he says, you keep those, by the way, faith and, what's the other word? Love. You know, you're to love the Word of God. He said, Timothy, don't just hold fast. Be, how, how will I be firmly fixed on the words? By faith and by love. I want to have a deep affection for the words of God. A deep affection for the Bible. And you find faith and love in Jesus Christ. And you find Jesus Christ in the Word of God. In other words, listen, if you're close to Jesus, you'll be close to the Bible. If you're close to your Bible, you'll be close to Jesus. You, you, you won't have one without the other. One's the written word, one's the living word. And they go together. You can't have one, somebody says, oh, I love Jesus, he's my best friend. Of course, I haven't read the Bible in a few months. Well, then he's not your best friend. See, you don't know him like you think you know him. He's in the book. These, Jesus himself said, these are they which testify of me. This is why you learn about Jesus. You won't, have to, you won't have to wear bracelets thinking, what would Jesus do? If you know the Bible, you'll know what he'd do. 
You'll know what he'd do because you'll know him. Leave behind, think about this, leave behind faith and love for the words of God. Faith and love for the words of God. That's, that's more valuable to leave behind than leaving behind stacks of money for your children or property for your children. Leave them all the material wealth you want in the world, but if they don't have an inheritance of faith and love in the Word of God, you're just leaving behind a corruptible inheritance. You leave love and faith in the Word of God, you're leaving behind something that's incorruptible and that fadeth not away. What an inheritance. What I thank God for, and you know, it's amazing, a while back, I think it was about a year ago, um, that we went up to Amish country and went through the... Uh, found some uh, genealogy of our family that I think years ago, back in the 1600s, I think, sometime, a, a, a slave ball came from Switzerland. You know what he came with, Brother, Brother Reed? He came with a songbook. How about that? All the way back there. And he came with a hymn book. And, and that's a heritage. You know, I listen, that's... Uh, more than, more than any material possessions that have gone on down through the generations. I thank God I had a grandfather and a father that had faith in God. That they had faith and love in the words of God. And, and they left that for me. That's, that's more valuable than any, any money or property that they would ever leave me. That's what you leave behind. So, so far, the two aspects are obviously what we were and what we leave behind. The third thing is verses 15 through 18, and that is how we influenced others. How we influenced others. Here we introduce to somebody here. First, in verse 15, he says, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. You know, Every one of us either help others or hurt others by the way we live. Every day, we either help others grow closer to Christ or we hurt them from growing closer to Christ. Paul here talks about first those who are hindered or hurting. All they in Asia be turned away from me. He names the two that kind of led the charge. Calls them out by name. Phygelus means fugitive. Fugitive. In other words, what's a fugitive? You remember years ago, was it the 60s? When there was a program on TV called The Fugitive? You remember, remember that one? Guys running all the time and then people would help them out and all that stuff. And, and uh, used to watch that as a kid. And uh, The Fugitive. Always on the run. Always on the move. Never able to stay long in one spot. Always moving around. Always on the run. Never staying put. Never being settled. Paul said, you know what? People like that don't help the cause of Christ. They hinder the cause of Christ. And we live in a very transient society. I understand that. But transient people are never much help to others. Remember, so often in the Bible it talks about how you'll be rooted in Christ, you'll be settled. You know what God does when He gets hold of you? He settles you down. Those are always moving and jumping around and never settling down. They don't help the cause of Christ very much. You know, the prodigal son, when he's there in the pig pen, and looking at the food that's going to the pigs, and he finally comes to himself, and he makes a decision, I'll go home to my father's house. Did you ever think about the fact, aren't you glad dad didn't move? Aren't you glad dad kept the farm? You know, he knew dad would still be there. 
he knew the farm would still be there. We don't know from the story how long he was gone. We don't know the sum of money he had. We don't know if it was a year or two years or three years or five years or ten years. We don't know. It seemed to be some period of time because the older brother who was upset that he came home and had a big party given was that all these years I've served you. So it could have been quite a length of time. But dad was still there. Dad was still right where he knew he'd be. And that's, of course, representative of God Himself. I am the Lord thy God. He says, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Always the same. One of the best things some could do for your Christian life is just settle. Let God settle you. Quit being a fugitive. Quit being on the run all the time. Settle. The second guy is Hermogenes. Somehow I always think about milk when I read his name, but that was his brother, Hermogenes. Yeah, this is Hermogenes. Hermogenes means generation of lucre. What's lucre in the Bible? Money. Generation of money. In other words, if you live your life for money, you're not going to be a help to others for Christ either. Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. Certainly we can use money and God uses money and God will bless some people with the ability. You go back to Abraham and even Job. You go back to some of the Old Testament saints. They were rich. But their heart wasn't on the riches. Their heart was on God. And God could entrust those riches to them. Certainly, we're thankful when God entrusts people with riches and know that their heart won't... Listen, money isn't the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. When I begin to love that money... Somebody was telling me it's a job they have and they don't, they're not required to work on a Sunday, but they say I'm, I, he was choosing to work on a Sunday. And I said, don't you do it. Don't you choose to work on the Lord's Day. That's the Lord's Day. And keep that for God. He will bless you for doing that. I believe that. It's so easy to... If the Lord had to warn us about the love of money, it must be an issue with us. The older I get, the more I see they're either people either live for the Lord or they live for the money. And all the, what consumes them when they get to be my age, what consumes them a lot is, do I have enough to retire on? Do I have enough to live on? And it consumes their every waking moment. You even hear the, the, the commercials on radio about people staying up in the middle of the night, you know, trying to figure it out, worrying about it. Well, listen, God, where's God? Does God take care of His children? Sure. God will take care of us. Folks not being settled or folks just living for money or the pleasure of other things says they'll hinder you. See, the people in Asia, once Paul went into the prison ministry, <laughs> he really went inside. They don't want to do it. Now it wasn't profitable for them. They didn't want to be associated with him. Remember, remember back in chapter 1, don't be ashamed of the Lord or me, his prisoner. Those in Asia were. These two fellows were. They didn't want anything to do with them. You know, it's kind of sad. Look in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy and verse 16. It's kind of sad. Look what Paul said. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God it may not be laid to their charge. Second Timothy four or Second Timothy four sixteen. Isn't it kind of sad? So, hey, you just we just talked the other night at the end of Romans, and I think Brother Bob was talking to me about all the people he lists, you know, his co laborers, people who worked with him, people who helped him. And he names them by name in several of the epistles. 
And he says, here, I got the end of my life. Think about it. I'm in prison for the last time. I know I'm not getting out of here alive. And I look around. Nobody's here. Nobody. How many times have I heard people say, I'm always talking to people when they're sick. I'm always helping somebody out when they need help. And then when I need help or I'm sick, nobody, talk, nobody calls me. Nobody sees me. I guess you're in good company. Paul had nobody. No one. If it can happen to Paul, I guess it can happen to you or me. These men were probably just fearful at the cost of standing with the Apostle Paul. Kind of like the disciples when you know, they killed Jesus and then they all locked themselves in the upper room. <laughs> Uh, wanna, they're going to come for us. They're going to have to break the door down anyway. No, none of them wanted to be seen. They were afraid they'd be next. That's why Paul said, I pray it won't be laid to their charge. He's not speaking judgment against his deserters. He didn't let it hinder his spirit. He prays for God to be merciful to them. Can, you, can we learn something this? Listen, I don't think this is in your notes. If you seek affirmation and support from other people, even other Christians, when you go through a difficult time, you're going to be disappointed. You see what Paul said back in verse 16 of 2 Timothy 4? When he said, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, no one's with him. But verse 17 comes, doesn't it? Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Who's going to be there when you think, hey, nobody, where is everybody? How come nobody cares about me? How come nobody calls me? How come nobody sees me? Hey, hey, the Lord is with you. He has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The one to strengthen you, the one that will never disappoint you, the one that will always be there is the Lord Jesus Christ. Earthly friends may prove untrue, but Jesus never fails. Oh, if we'd get a hold of that. The Lord stood by me. That's the key right there. That's the hindering. Now let's look at the helping. This is a blessing. Onesiphorus. He's a great man. Only mentioned twice here in Timothy in the whole Bible. But he's a great man. Yet I've never met any family that named their boy Onesiphorus. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Onesiphorus, his name means bringing advantage. Bringing advantage. He was repeatedly encouraging. He said he oft refreshed me. Often he was a refreshment to the Apostle Paul. And by the way, notice again, verse 17, when he was in Rome, he sought me out, how? Very diligently and found me. I think of the lost sheep when the shepherd goes out and seeks diligently until he finds the sheep. He didn't just, he, went, he wasn't taking no for an answer. He was going to find Paul and where they had him imprisoned and he was going to minister to him. Don't just do good as opportunities arise. Seek out opportunities to do good. Go after them. Is there somebody that you ought to hunt up or hunt down and cheer up? <laughs> Go looking for them. Give them some cheer. He was not ashamed to be associated with Paul. He was not ashamed of my chain wasn't ashamed that he was associating with a prisoner. We're reminded that a friend loveth at all times. 
Now it's interesting if you notice, if you noticed. Here and in chapter 4 also, notice the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. In chapter 19, salute Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Do you notice he never salutes Onesiphorus? Just his house? I take it that Onesiphorus is no longer alive. That he is gone. But Paul wants to recognize the household. I think Onesiphorus has already gone to be with the Lord. And Paul is praying in verse 18 that the Lord would grant unto him that he'd find mercy of the Lord in that day. That's the day of judgment. The day when we stand before God and receive the things done in our body. And Jesus said in Mark 10 and verse 42 that whoever gives, gives a, a, a cup of water in my name, he'll in no wise lose his reward. Just, just giving to someone else or giving to the man of God, God says, I take that as being done unto me. And you will be rewarded for that. And no one, you know the great thing about it? No one else has to know. One of the, one of the, you know, one of the sad things that 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 Facebook has done. I heard today on the on the news. If Facebook were a nation, it would be the largest nation on earth. There's there's I think two and a half billion people that log into Facebook worldwide. But you know one of the sad things about social media, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, all these other things, you know what it is? People do good things and they don't keep it to themselves. They do something good, they do something nice. You know what they want to do? Put it on social media. Why? So everybody can say, oh, you're so nice. Oh, you're so giving. Oh, you're such, you're always so thoughtful. But you know, Jesus said something about those who do what they did to get the praise of men. And Jesus said they have their reward. That's it. Oh, it's nice if you want to enjoy that. Or, or you look and say, well, how many people liked what I did? How many likes did I get? How many comments did I get? Wouldn't it be great to just have some people that will be good to other people and help other people and do good to the servants of God and not tell anybody about it? And one day, have the Lord give them the reward. Don't, don't settle for the reward here when you can have it from the Master. When you can get it from God and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Onesimus, I'm sure... Got a reward. One of those guys in the Bible you don't hear much about. But he was a blessing to the Apostle Paul when, when no one stood with him. But Onesimus found him. Sought, looked for him diligently and sought him out. He'll reward you. Paul couldn't reward him. <laughs> He's in chains. He's in prison. But he said the Lord will reward him. The Lord will take care of him. And he will. And he will. Neither hindering or you're helping. How have you influenced others? That's what people will remember. That's what people will remember. That's how to be remembered. The three aspects. What you were. What you leave behind. And who you influenced. For the Lord Jesus. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for the words tonight from 2 Timothy. Thank you for the Apostle Paul having you giving him these words to pen for us. It's helped us tonight. Lord, none of us know. I'd like to think everyone would be back in church Sunday and next Wednesday, but we do not know what a day may bring forth. None of us can boast ourselves of tomorrow. Our life is just a vapor here for a little while and then vanishes away. I 
I think that songwriter was pretty accurate when he said, only one life, so soon it will pass, and only what's done for Christ will last. I think he knew what he was talking about. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be what we ought to be for you. That we will focus on leaving behind the words of God, faith and love for your word to those behind us. And that we'll have the influence of helping others to love God and to love Christ and not to hurt them. Help us to be settled. Help us not to just be moving and jumping about all the time. Help us not to live for money. To love, to love money more than we love you. Lord, help us to use the money that you give to us as good stewards to further the cause of Christ on this earth. Now, Lord, dismiss us with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. May others see Christ in us this week. May you give us opportunities to give the gospel to people. See them trust you as their Savior. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.